I talk about the effects of dehydration and my own personal experiences of it and how bad it can get. The wind's picked up a bit. I'll just sort of show you the end of a 30 mile day, the difference in the color of my pee. Now, the question is, do I drink it? You'll see on a lot of survival programs or TV shows, films, reenactments, encounter real life stories of survival situations and people like Bear Grylls, you'll see them drink their own weed. A lot of survival, adventuring, endurance, anything that you do and a lot of the time on my walk, it's about opportunity and finding the opportunity and I just came through some farmland. There was an honesty box there with a load of these radishes, peppers and cucumbers, so I grabbed the cucumber, the pepper and a handful of radishes. I've eaten sheep's eyes before in Russia and parts of Asia. I've eaten fish eyes too. Unfortunately, the eyes and most of the face on this sheep have already been stripped by other local wildlife. Judging by the smell and the swell on the body, it's been here for some time. My diet is predominantly vegetable based, about 80% not meat. That is by choice for, f for a few reasons, partly environmental and my feelings on meat being a cost to the environment, partly health, also I just love vegetables, but they're lower impact on the environment. However, one of the fundamental reasons when you're doing anything like what I'm doing now is that meat costs more water to digest than vegetables. You, you gain a lot of water. So a pepper, for example, is about 94% water. And the rest of that 6% is just nutrients, goodness, vitamin C, radish. A bit like a cucumber. Mm. There's so much water. You actually burn more calories eating them than you gain. Don't bother me. Tastes great. I'm not actually that far from civilization at the moment, and I'm not dehydrated. But I have experienced the effects of severe dehydration, and I'm all too familiar with the feelings of how maddening it can be. When we rode across the Atlantic, we went on a water ban after our water maker broke for approximately 12 days. In searing 40 degree heat, the strange thing about dehydration is it's not something you can really train for. At, at the time we went on a, a water ban, we'd been used to drinking seven or eight litres of water a day, sometimes with isotonic energy replacement drinks. And we dropped from that, still run an average in 12 hours a day each, to approximately one litre a day each. That one litre a day was allocated for cooking, cleaning and drinking. Because of my experiences in other areas and doing other things, both sporting and endurance based, and my own personal experimentations, I know what my body is capable of. And at that point on the Atlantic when our water maker broke, we had two choices. Stop and call in for rescue, which was never really an option for either of us. Or continue, ration out our water, think about our food supplies, plot our route, stay rational and try and fix the water maker. The thing is the effects of dehydration can be severe on the kidneys and other internal organs. If they're not being flushed through properly, they're keeping toxins inside you. Dehydration also means you won't sweat properly. This means your skin won't cool, which can lead to heat stroke, which trust me, you don't want. Prolonged dehydration can also weaken cartilage in the joints, which is 85% water. also cause involuntary muscle movement, burning vital calories and energy that you need for other things. 
but perhaps most importantly is the effect it can have on your brain and your decision making and the way you think. People talk about this less because they don't have experience of it. I do. And it's something I never want to experience again. Rowing the Atlantic is an achievement that I'm extremely proud of and I draw on that for lots of experiences in my daily life. I'll be proud of this walk when I'm finished walking around the coast of Britain. I'm also excited about the valuable lessons the outdoors life is teaching me. I think one of the greatest positives I take from that experience is that I experienced it with someone and maybe those same hallucinations and same response patterns made up for the fact that we were in tune together and we were experiencing it together, not just as friends, but as people going through a severe traumatic experience. That was an endurance event like no other. This is different. Walking along the coast, yeah, it sounds like a great little holiday, but the reality is loneliness often sets in and that has just as much of an impact as anything else. And I remember during that period, roughly around the same time, we were both so malnourished as well as dehydrated. We had really pushed our body to its extreme limits. I'd lost almost five stone at that point, And I think Tom had probably lost somewhere similar because of that lack of water we were both rowing at night and we were having these strange hallucinations at one point tom actually believed that there was another person on the boat trying to steal our food rations and he kept talking to me about this other person but the even stranger thing was we would hear things out at sea in the night and the mind's very clever it will play tricks on you it would deceive you i can remember particularly a baby crying and a dog barking and someone shouting the name Katie. It's not possible that those things were actually out there and happening, but we had these audible hallucinations and this stranger thing still is that very often we had the same audible hallucinations. In my time alone out here walking the coast, I've been reflecting on other events. Loneliness and dehydration specifically are things that had an impact on both Tom and I. And I remember various conversations that we had, and one in particular stood out. And Tom said to me, I need to let off some steam. I'm just going to go for a walk. Do you want anything out of the shop? And I looked at him, and I couldn't process what he was saying, but neither could he. We were in the middle of the Atlantic. Where was he going to go for a walk? There's a million square miles of open ocean surrounding us and the nearest person to us was probably in the space station. You think you're thinking normally and you're talking to each other or yourself on a lot of occasions. And then you play it back in your mind and it still makes sense. And it's only maybe the fifth or sixth time where you play it back again and you realise that maybe Maybe what you're saying and what you're thinking isn't quite right. It's not, it's no longer rational. I'm filming this and it's early morning. The temperature's around 15 degrees at the moment, approximately 6 a.m. I know from yesterday's experience that today's gonna get up to about 24, 25 degrees. I'm on a fairly isolated stretch of coastline. I have backup water supplies with me. I've stowed my bag over there and I'm walking this stretch of coastline without carrying it deliberately because it's pretty arid and I don't know where the next refill points are. So should you drink your own pee in desperation? The answer is no. The British Army Field Manual lists urine along with blood and serious other chemicals as do not drink under any circumstances, which makes sense. You wee because you are getting rid of toxins in the body. It also doesn't taste very nice. Just because I put myself in these risky positions doesn't mean I haven't thought about it. And it certainly doesn't mean you should put yourself in the same positions. I hope you all enjoy listening to me talk about dehydration. Join me next time when I talk about loneliness.